to the inside of the Lincoln Presbyterian Church for just the second time since May 17th. I don't know if it's because we pushed uh, worship back an hour, but an hour ago it was down for you, so I don't think that would have mattered much. But it is wonderful to see everybody here and gathered. I know that our numbers are still uh, within safe levels to be indoors, uh, but I do want to encourage everyone to stay safe out there, stay respectful. There's still a lot uh, that we don't know, but keep your faith strong, and above all, represent Jesus well. And uh, be a very understanding and caring for other people. I know that we've shifted back to start worship at 10.30. Traditionally, we do this to kick off the Christian education for the uh, Sunday school kids. Adult Sunday school did meet this morning in the fellowship hall. And uh, thank you, Ken, for preparing a lesson. And uh, Scott also shared a little bit about uh, the Book of Mysteries by Jonathan Khan. And uh, it's a really cool uh, book of wisdom. Ken talked about the issue of forgiveness and what happens if we sin after we are Christians, after we're baptized. It still happens. We still are prone to fall. And so it was a really good discussion. We'll have more of that discussion. And Sunday School will continue to meet uh, around 9.15, 9.30. Do you have a real strict attendance date, uh, Ken? <laughs> All right. 9.15, sure. Be there. Uh, but it is great to have everybody gathered here. We are having communion this Sunday to celebrate the presence of the body of Christ. And as we uh, come forward for communion, um, Hal and Nancy, you will be forward, correct? And you will uh, invite people forward uh, individually. And, uh, so we will process up the center aisle, keeping our distance and uh, taking our communion elements with us back to the pews. And so that's how the communion process will work later on in the service. Uh, before we begin service, I have a few announcements. First, I want to congratulate uh, Matt and Carly Hawks, Carly formerly Adams. They got married yesterday, and uh, I presided over the wedding. It was a very beautiful service, so congratulate them. <coughs> Excuse me. And I also uh, want to remind everyone that we will have a time for prayer towards the end of the service, and to continue to pray for the Christinos. And Matt's mother, Connie, passed away last uh, on Monday, and uh, they got the news that she was uh, going uh, downhill on last Sunday. And so uh, we offer you our condolences, and we'll continue to lift you up in our prayers. Uh, now, next Sunday, we have a session meeting scheduled for after service, and we will either be meeting outside in the library or the fellowship hall. We will solidify that over the next week. Are there any other announcements that uh, anyone wishes to lift up this time? Yes, Scott. Good. Good.
please pray for Nicole and Riley and, and um, everybody there. So. Uh, and then, Cindy, are you still selling tickets for the lasagna dinner? Don't forget that. So we'll right, see. Yeah. Somebody will be out there.
Lord, too, we ask forgiveness for those ways we have fallen short when we know we have done wrong. Lord, take away any rationalization that we might have and give us your truth, your truth of reconciliation. And Lord, now we lift up those ways we have fallen short and the ways that we know that we have fallen short. Lord, let us feel these burdens being lifted from our shoulders, taking them upon you as we take your yoke upon our shoulders and do your work, moving forward, following your footsteps. And Lord, we know that we are forgiven once and for all with the sacrifice of your Son upon the cross. Let us live into that freedom by serving you Well, I know that for our children's moments, we have Gus with us, but everyone else has moved past that stage when we have grown up. And of course, when we grow up, we know that we have already learned everything there is to be learned. We cannot learn anything more because we know better. No, that is certainly not the case. I was also going to spare the kids the intricacies of what yeast is and what yeast does scientifically, because I don't want them to lose their appetite for delicious bread. But the parable here that Jesus is talking about in Matthew is a parable of hidden growth. When you make bread and you add yeast to that bread, what do you do? You let it sit, you cover it with a, with a damp towel, and then what happens when you return to it, if all goes well, about an hour later? It rises. Now, does anyone have a story where you put in too much yeast and the dough rose over the bowl? Yeah, it happens. Now, in this parable that we open worship this morning, how many pounds of flour did this woman mix this yeast into? Sixty pounds of flour. That's probably enough to fill a room after that yeast gets done working through its way through that. And the reason Jesus presents this incredible proliferation is because that is God's kingdom. God's kingdom is working its way to grow until it encompasses everything. And I want to encourage you to know that I want God to do the same thing in your own heart. So that what you say, what you do, how you see things reflects God's kingdom. Jesus is teaching us to look at everyday things in a new way so that we can see God's kingdom at work. Now, yeast didn't always have a good connotation with the Hebrew people, and that is why this uh, passage, that this image that Jesus used was so interesting. Now, yeast was commonly used in society. Why? because it makes delicious, fluffy bread. It, it has, ever since the ancient Egyptians uh, started using yeast, and, and the uh, Hebrews were the same, and lot, lots of other cultures were the same. They used the yeast in both bread making and also the process of fermentation to create alcoholic drink. Uh, but yeast also had a somewhat negative connotation and I'll share with you now some of the origins of that. Our first scripture lesson is from Exodus 12, verses 14 to 19. And the context of this is, this was what God was telling Moses after nine plagues had 
come down upon Egypt, and Pharaoh would still not let the Hebrew people free who were enslaved in Egypt. After describing the Passover, this is what the Lord tells Moses. This is the day you are to commemorate. For the generations to come, you shall celebrate it as a festival to the Lord, a lasting ordinance. For seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day, remove the yeast from your houses. For whoever eats anything with yeast in it, from the first day through the seventh, must be cut off from Israel. On the first day, hold a sacred assembly, and another one on the seventh day. Do not work at all on these days, except to prepare food for everyone to eat. That is all you may do. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread, because it was on this very day that I brought your divisions out of Egypt. Celebrate this day as a lasting ordinance for the generations to come. This is the holy wisdom and a holy word. And so with this comes a tradition that is still practiced by Jewish families all over the world, is that on Passover, one of the things that you have to do in preparation is to find all of the yeast in the house, any yeast that is hidden. So it's kind of like a bit of a scavenger hunt for the kids to participate in as well. So all of your Fleischmann's active dry yeast packets, or if anything, you get some down at the whole food store, or any semblance of yeast, you have to remove it from the house. It can't even tempt you. And so that is why I often call this. You can call it the Festival of Unleavened Bread. You could also call it the Feast Without Yeast. I think that has a better ring to it. But the idea here is that they had to leave in haste. They had to eat the Passover lamb in haste because they had to get out of Egypt. They had to do it quickly. They had no time to let the bread rise. This is something that they had to do with urgency. And so yeast was somewhat associated with becoming complacent, with, uh, with bad, with certain things that were bad. And so Jesus himself used this image of yeast in teaching on the negative things. In Matthew 16, 5 to 6, uh, Jesus' disciples were, uh, they were traveling and preaching, and listen to what happened. When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. This is the holy wisdom and holy word. So when they forgot to take bread, first of all, I preached before from up here about the problems of becoming a little bit angry or irritated because you're a little bit hungry. And once the disciples forget to bring the food across the lake, they can't exactly go back and get the food. So they had to find a new food source, but Jesus explicitly told them, not to take any bread from the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He specifically talked about yeast. I'll get to what Jesus was talking about in a minute, but it's this negative connotation of the yeast of uh, a group of people. So the Apostle Paul picks up on this as well. And in Galatians 5, 7, and 9, he is preaching to the people, warning them against yeast. Paul writes, you are running a good race. Who cut in on you to keep you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. I am confident to the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion, whoever that may be, will have to pay the penalty. And this is the holy wisdom and holy word. And Paul continues in 1 Corinthians 5 and 6, another letter, he talks about yeast. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you 
really are, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. This is the holy wisdom and the holy word. And so the yeast working its way through the whole batch has to do with the proliferation of bad teaching, of bad information. And this was a real serious problem. Because the thing about bad information is that once that seed is planted, before you know it, it spreads and it spreads. And if you've ever played a game of telephone, you know how it can be twisted and new facts are added. And all of a sudden, what started off as something that was just a little impurity has now grown hidden to consume the community. This is how growth works. You see this with weeds. You see this with mold on bread. It spreads awfully quickly. And now if you think about misinformation, I don't need to say a whole lot about the dangers of misinformation in our society that values free speech today combined with the incredible information technology that we have today, where information can spread across the whole entire planet in seconds. That is unbelievable. All the same, this warning against the proliferation of misinformation is more evident today than it ever has been. But here's the problem. Who is right? Isn't that always the question? Because ever since creation, people trying to convince other people of a certain reality has been the way it's been. And what Jesus wants his followers to do is to rise Above all of these different competing sources of information and see God's truth, the elements in front of them. He wants people to care for other individuals with who they are and not be utterly consumed by a certain worldview that is simply presented to them and that reinforces what they already believe in their hearts. There is a danger to continue to believe what you have always believed and to reinforce your own biases. This is reality. And this is what Jesus was teaching against. And what was interesting is when Jesus' disciples heard Jesus say, be on guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, it sounded like they started thinking about some conspiracies about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, that they were duping other people into buying poisoned bread, or that the bread that they sold was impure. I don't really know what they were talking about because we don't know exactly how the disciples took this information that Jesus gave them. But Jesus quickly turned around, and I'm going to read Matthew 7 and 12 now, to let them know exactly what he is talking about. Aware of their discussion, Jesus asked, You of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? Don't you remember the five loaves for the five thousand and how many basketfuls you gathered? Or the seven loaves for the four thousand and how many basketfuls you gathered? How is it that you don't understand that I was not talking to you about bread? Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he was not telling them to guard against the yeast used in bread but against the teachings of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. 
this is the point. Jesus wanted to show them through his teaching the dangers of the proliferation of bad teaching. And the thing about the Pharisees and the Sadducees, quite frankly, were at that time, in the political culture, they were two opposing political parties that were priests in the temple. The Pharisees, and I've taught this before, but it's a good reminder, were, were a people and a group of religious leaders who believed in the bodily resurrection. They believed in miracles. They believed in steadfast righteousness and a strict adherence to the law. They were very faithful and very defending a God of the law. They believed in God's righteousness and they believed it to the core. The Apostle Paul was a Pharisee when he was teaching. They were zealous about defending God and God's righteousness. But the Sadducees, on the other hand, they held power and did not believe in the resurrection. They wanted to enact change in their society through the world. They often cozied up to Roman governors and the occupiers so that they could hold their power. Uh, but that is the only one thing that they held in common with the Pharisees. The Pharisees also wanted to hold on to their power. Money was important to both groups. And so you get a little bit of a picture. The Pharisees and the Sadducees came at things in very differing ways. But in the end, it was still a somewhat worldly way. And Jesus asked them to guard against those two teachings because it is so easy fall in to those sort of predetermined sects. And Paul also uses that, that image of yeast when, when he uh, preaches to the divisions of the Galatian church, is that there was a, a, a problem with those who were of the Hebrew faith, who were circumcised, and those new converts to the Greek faith who were uncircumcised, who were Greeks. It's still the, it's the Christian faith. And they were forming dissensions. There were teachers coming in saying, you have to follow the Hebrew law. You have to be circumcised in order to be a part of this group. And they were splitting and making divisions among the group. And so you listen to these uh, verses that Paul writes after he talks about being aware and, and being aware of the, of the East. Galatians 5, 5 to 6. For through the Spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. This is the Holy Wisdom and the Holy Word. That's the only thing that counts. It's faith expressing itself through love. And this might look different in different contexts. That is exactly why Jesus wanted the people to look at things around them in a new light. Rise above the divisions of your day and don't get sucked into being put in one category or another and buying into everything that everybody teaches. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. That is why Jesus told them this final parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it's worked its way all through the dough. Jesus spoke all these things in parables did not say anything to them without using a parable. It was this sort of hidden nature of God's kingdom that Jesus wanted to illustrate. God's will will come to pass. In 
order to see God's truth, your whole perspective is to see how this is working its way, even amidst misinformation and bad teaching and ways that people are being corrupted. God's kingdom is still growing among all of those things. And we have to recognize that. Because it starts with us. So Dallas Willard wrote a, a pretty well-known book, an excellent book called The Divine Conspiracy. I don't know how many of you have read some of it or parts of it. But there's so much rich, uh, so much rich writing in that. He does such a good job. And his main point is that God, amidst all of these things that are happening, is working towards everyone's salvation. We have to accept that, expect it in our own lives, and be on God's side and working towards that. And here's the thing that he writes that sticks with me. It's a short and sweet and makes total sense. We are becoming who we will be forever. We are becoming who we will be forever, and a reminder of that is the meal that we are about to partake in. Jesus' final object lesson, his final parable, the final way that he taught of a thing that was hidden since the creation of the world, were two elements. That is the bread and the fruit of the vine. What did Jesus say? This bread is my body given for you. This fruit of the vine is my blood poured for you. A new covenant that gives new life. And in one of our confessions in the Presbyterian Church, this is the second Helvetic Confession penned by Heinrich Bullinger, who was a Swiss theologian right around the, Refor the time of the Reformation in the mid-16th mid century. He wrote that to sanctify or consecrate anything to God is to dedicate it to holy uses. That is, to take it from the common and ordinary use and appoint it to holy use. For the signs and the sacraments are drawn from common use. These things external and visible. In the Lord's Supper, the outward sign is the bread and the wine, taken from things commonly used for meat and drink. But the thing that is signified is the body of Christ which was given, and his blood which was shed for us, for the communion of the body and the blood of the Lord. So, as we eat this bread, this leavened bread, remember the urgency that was present in the first Passover to turn from sin. Remember that it was just a starting point for your growth in Christ. And remember, as you consume this bread, feel it consume your body. As God's kingdom consumes your heart, your mind, your soul, and movement of your limbs. As you drink this blood, remember that body that was given and the blood that was shed for us. Feel this. And remember God's growing kingdom that will consume all. That is the hope that we have. On the night of his betrayal, Jesus reclined at the table with his disciples. And he said, I have eagerly desired to share this Passover meal with you before I suffer. For truly I tell you, I will not partake of it again, and I will not partake of it again until the kingdom of God comes. 
He then took the cup, he gave thanks, and he said, Take this cup and divide it amongst yourselves. For truly I tell you, I will not again partake of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. In a like manner, giving thanks, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, Take it. This is my body given for you. After supper, he took the cup and he said, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood for you.
Lord, we lift them up now to your presence. For the Christina King. For Mark. Lord, lift each one of these names that have crossed our minds and raised our lips. Teach them to see with your sight. To see the hope that is present in your word, that is working through the world, and to reject those things that they have seen to be evil. And Lord, teach us to take things one step at a time, not getting ahead of ourselves, but in your path. As we pray these words, your son taught us to pray and pray now together. In our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us now our daily bread as we forgive, as we forgive our friends. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory and the right. Amen. Now join with me in seeing him now. Well, I'm really joined with me yeah. in your mind. Uh, and I'll sing the uh, first and last verses of him 2175. Together we serve. Thank you. 